Welcome to Conversations. My name is Jason Plotkin, Program Director at Congregation Emmanuel. Every week we sit down with a member of the congregation, the community, or perhaps even from the sports world to discuss the current state of affairs. Many in this audience are probably aware that my wife, Elisa, and I wrote an article a few weeks ago about being a multiracial Jewish family. For those on Facebook or YouTube, I'll make sure to share the link with this interview. I really value the work that's being done in our community to keep this conversation going about racial inequalities, creating a welcoming environment for everybody, whether they're Jews of color or anyone else, quite frankly, and more. As a white father to a black son, I often find myself navigating unfamiliar territory. This was something I expected when Elise and I adopted Isaac, who will be turning five years old in a few weeks. Fortunately, I've had a friend, an ally in all this, and I'm happy today to welcome to our show the head men's basketball coach of the NCAA Division I University of New Orleans Privateers, Mark Schlesinger. Coach Schles, come on the air if you don't mind. And let's see, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. What a cool platform. I appreciate you having me. Well, it's, it's neat that I've been able to bring friends from my, my, my old life in New Orleans or, and just re, re, reconnect and also educate our friends here at Congregation Emmanuel and in the greater community. Uh, so for our loyal listeners, to set the stage for our conversation, let's talk about your family dynamic so people can understand why it is that you are the one I wanted to bring on. Let's tell, me, tell us about your family and how your family grew to include three uh, beautiful children. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been an amazing journey. My wife and I uh, met here in New Orleans. Ironically, um, you know the story well, but we we met here in New Orleans back in I want to say 2005. I'm terrible with dates, but we met here uh, at uh, we flew into the airport together and met here at, at the baggage claim, waiting on our bags. I looked over and saw this beautiful uh, woman, and we started talking and and hit it off pretty quickly and and like saying you know we're married you know a year later and uh she got convinced her to move to Natchitoches which I was living at the time and my wife is is uh from North Carolina an African-American female uh so you know we had an interesting dynamic already from the beginning and uh we we uh were you know obviously in love we wanted to be uh parents we wanted to have a family we talked about at one point from the very beginning, we talked about uh, either beginning getting involved in foster care or adopting at some point in our family dynamic. Uh, when the time came and, and we got to the end of the road of, of us beginning trying to, to get pregnant and trying to, uh, to have our own children and we went through all the, the things that so many people go through uh, with no avail, uh, we began exploring uh, our state uh, foster care system through here in the state of Louisiana, the Department of Children and Family Services. Uh, so we began the training and began, uh, you know, f fostering. And uh, we always had the plan to foster to adopt. And to kind of make a long story short, we've we've been blessed to, to adopt three children uh, from here in the in the greater New Orleans metropolitan area. Uh, my my oldest son is eight now. His name is Holden. Uh, and he's from south of New Orleans. I know some people don't believe that there's actually a south of New Orleans, but there's a, a way south of New Orleans down in Plaquemines Parish. Uh, so he's from about an hour south of New Orleans out towards the Gulf. And, uh, and he is Caucasian. And then uh, my daughter, Nola Ann, like New Orleans, Nola, uh, was born here in New Orleans. And so she's seven. And then our baby uh, is Bo, and he's 18 months old. Uh, and he's biracial, and he's from, and he was born here in, in New Orleans as well. Uh, we've had other, uh, we've had been able to have, be lucky enough to have probably eight or nine placements uh, in foster care uh, throughout our time since we've done that in the last uh, eight and a half years. Uh, some ranging from as short as 48 hours, and some uh, that have been with us uh, for well over a year. So uh, it's been an interesting family dynamic for us, for sure. And I, you know, it's interesting as suffice to say, obviously you were one of my, you were the most significant exposure I had to the foster care system and adoption. Um, unbelievably, when, when this was going on, when you first started this, I was 29, 30 years old. So, I mean, that wasn't something I was exposed to. And then when I was at UNO, 
we were able to tell your story on a real national level. I mean, we got coverage, CBS Sports, Greg Doyle, great national writer locally, Brian Alley Walsh. And using your platform, you've given people a sense of what the foster system is. How have you used that coverage to, you know, educate people about foster care adoption? I really think it's fascinating. Yeah, I, th I think kind of from our end, um, you know, just like um, a lot of the things that, that I've learned with, with you and Elisa, you know, so much of, of who you are is, is faith-based and so much, you know, begins in your core of your faith and who you are and what you believe your calling is. And that's the same for us. Um, as, as a Christian couple that we've always believed that was a calling for us, that, that there were kids in need, and there were kids in need that were immediately in our backyard, uh, that, that were right here, that needed homes, that needed help, uh, whether that was a permanent home or forever home uh, through adoption, or maybe that might have been uh, for a season. As a basketball coach, I've tried to uh, equate a lot of my experiences with uh, our family and kind of because people always say well how do you handle it you get so attached I don't think I could do it um, and I really put it in the process of, of I may coach a player for a season and I may have a, a young person or, or a child in our home uh, in foster care for a season and while they're there in our home in that season uh, we've got to be the best parents we can for them and make them feel safe and loved uh, and cared for and do the best we can and we've been able to share that platform um, openly and we talked about it initially and I know you and I did too when kind of the national story came about of I was very very hesitant uh, about doing it and then in the end we decided uh, to do it just because it, it gave some people an opportunity to see that it can be done that there are plenty of kids that are out there that that need help uh, and need need to feel safe and need to feel loved and it was a platform for us to just say, hey, it's okay to, to give this a shot. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be um, any Superman by any means, but you've got to be willing uh, to try and open up your home uh, to people. And so that, that platform, it's amazing. Uh, just the article alone uh, that, that created a dialogue and a conversation uh, with probably four or five different couples and people on campus here, uh, just on our UNO campus that have either got into foster care or have adopted themselves, that they saw the article, they saw the story, uh, they met us, we were able to talk to them about it and uh, kind of a little bit break down some of the walls and the stigma that go with um, with the experience. And I think people have, uh, have really taken to it and it's given us an opportunity to hopefully uh, help some people beyond their own home. Now, you and I have talked about raising kids multiple times. I mean, I remember after a win, here in Houston against Houston Baptist earlier this year, after you did your radio interview with Jude, you spent some time talking with me and it was really, really powerful. And I, you know, obviously appreciate that friendship. Um, but, you know, people come up to me and Eliza, obviously her and I are Caucasian. Isaac is, is black. Um, and I don't think he picks up on this, but people ask where, where are you from? Where's he from? Right. <laughs> right, you know, right. Probably from Africa, and I'm thinking to myself, no, he actually grew up, he was actually born here in Houston, kind of like your, your children are from the New Orleans area. Um, how do you recommend as a parent navigating conversations like this when your kids are in earshot? I mean, maybe Isaac, obviously he's not even five years old, he doesn't understand, but you know, how do you, what happens when your kids approach you even about these kind of things, these kind of comments that they might hear at their school from friends who are, you know, not necessarily aware of what they're saying about their siblings, et cetera. I think one of the things that we've tried to do from the beginning is, is not, is not um, hide or disguise uh, the circumstances of the situation in which they came to, into our home. And so we've always tried to be uh, very deliberate and forthright of uh, that. I'm the luckiest dad in the world that I got to be your father. I get to be your daddy. I get to be your forever dad. And I'm the luckiest guy in the world. And here is why you were, came to our home. Uh, because either it wasn't safe uh, where you were currently living, or maybe uh, the opportunity and the means for you to be cared for uh, in a way that you were safe and loved wasn't there at that time. And, and it's, it's amazing that they understood that early, as, at an early age, even at five, six, seven years old, they understand that. And they get pretty quickly, uh, especially as they get into school, that when I show up to pick them up, uh, 
you know, the, the kids will always ask, well, is that your dad? Or is that, is that really your dad? You know, and so Noah Ann will say, yeah, that's really my dad. <laughs> so it's always funny. And I just said, we always just tell them, hey, everyone's house looks a little bit different. And luckily, we're Schlesinger's, and luckily, you get to be in our home. And luckily, we got a, a great, amazing family. And um, it doesn't, I don't know that, that it gets, that you have to get super deep at an early stage for them. They just need to understand that it's okay and that they're loved and that everything is going to be okay. You know, a, a bit of a follow up to that, you know, as Lisa and I wrote about our feelings after George, the George Floyd incident, um, we talked about situations that we had been in. And I personally realized there were situations where I didn't realize necessarily what was going on at that time that might have been inappropriate that someone was saying to me. It just didn't resonate. You know, maybe I was in my own bubble of denial, if you will, um, to what was really going on. How do you, as a, as a parent, change your thinking so that you can think about what's going on in the moment versus, you know, here I am later in the day or maybe the next week, like, oh boy, that, that's not how that should have gone. The, the one thing I think that, we, that I've always tried to get across, not just to my children at home, but to our, our players, is that right is right and wrong is wrong. And always doing the right thing is the right thing to do. And so sometimes uh, I've told them that it's, it, it, you'll be, make uncomfortable decisions, uh, but your peace of mind and doing the right thing will always uh, be your guiding light to, to taking you where you want to go. And so there's been some situations where even here, um, you know, where I've been in situations where people have said inappropriate things and the people, that, they didn't know me and didn't know my background. They didn't know my job. They didn't know my family background. And the people around them were all kind of like, whoa, like, hey, buddy, you better, I don't know if you should say that, and, you know, and I'll politely say, hey, I don't appreciate your tone. I don't appreciate your words. Uh, if you could hold off on that or, or I'll go someplace else, you know? And I think that they get the, generally they've gotten the point pretty quickly. And um, I, and I, and it doesn't have to be, I'm, I'm never in an, I'm never in an uh, interest to argue with people uh, because the people that are hunting arguments, they don't ever want to change their mind. They always want to keep their mind uh, set on what they were. So I don't, I rarely hunt out an argument, but there's a lot of times that I'll, just say, hey, I don't appreciate the tone or don't appreciate the direction of where you're going uh, with that, with those comments. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I think the, the challenge that I have right now is that Isaac is hearing things, whether I realize it or not. I mean, the name George Floyd, you know, Black Lives Matter, matter. Um, when issues in society arise, I mean, Isaac was talking to a neighbor kid about coronavirus, and had, you know, early on and had no clue what was going on how do you ensure the environment of continued learning and growth for your kids how do you approach subjects such as strong as you know what's going on in our society i mean you know cnn luckily has done some sesame street things which have kind of resonated with isaac but i think it's more powerful coming from a parent right so right. how are you doing that in your house with the kids you have we went through that same thing because um uh you know, on the news cycle, just in flipping channels, uh, there, there was, you know, some very powerful imagery and, um, trying to, to go through what was age appropriate for them to understand and learn and what was not. And I think, um, you know, up until really we got into school age, uh, even in our home dynamic, they did now, I mean, I'm very blessed in that, um, with my job, they've never seen anything but diversity uh, on my job and them being around my student athletes uh, and around my coaching staff and that. So they've never seen anything that, that is dissimilar than what our home looks like. They've only seen that. Uh, and luckily in, in New Orleans, there's a, there's a great, um, different from growing up in the Midwest, there's a, there's a great mix of, of people that interact on a daily basis uh, of different races uh, that, that, you know, you, you, you're forced to, to have interactions and I think uh, break down a lot of walls that exist in the Midwest just because the, of a lack of diversity of maybe some of the areas in which I grew up. Um, but we've talked a lot about in, in context of your question with our, with our kids of 
of are they treating people the way you want to be treated? Uh, are they treating their neighbors? Love your neighbor as if you would love yourself. A very, a very simple biblical principle. Uh, and, you know, just just be kind to other people. Or I talk a lot with my son about being a gentleman. And I said, uh, is, would you say that that guy is being a gentleman? And I think clearly defining those things with them uh, quickly of how you want to be treated and, you know, what, being able to d differentiate between their friends at school of whether they're kind to them or not kind to them and understand that the people that are not kind to them, uh, it's okay that they don't have to play with them. They don't have to, uh, to, 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 to do those things. I think setting those early boundaries has been big. But it's a weird space to navigate with that age because there's a lot of things that are way more complex than probably they can understand at this point. And I thought, like you, I thought we used the Sesame Street piece too, and I thought it was helpful um, with them. But I think I think it's it's a very interesting dynamic, and I don't know that there's one set clear answer, other than uh, you have to continually uh, make them feel safe and make them feel loved uh, in order to get them to understand the concepts that you're trying to teach. Yeah. And, you know, you brought up just now, like your, your kids being exposed to that diversity and New Orleans is very diverse. Obviously your team, very diverse group. Aliza wrote a, a blog a few weeks ago about the books that we exposed Isaac to and the books. And I'm happy to post that link for those again on Facebook and YouTube. Um, but the, the books and, and picture a black, president, a black teacher, a, a young black boy jumping off the dive, diving board. And of course, Isaac has no fear of that kind of thing. But, you know, last time you and I talked, we talked about um, setting up role models for Isaac that, and, and you know, that mirrors who he looks like and who he can inspire to be. Correct. Let's, let's yeah. talk about that some. What have yeah. you done for your children? What are recommendations you'd give um, to people about people that you know they can aspire to be or mirror who they look like yeah there's there's an interesting uh story and and more than an answer i'll give you give you a story and an example of that um i've been really lucky that one of my one of my players former players is a, is a young man named Corey dixon he's not young now he's 30 um so i began recruiting him when he was 16 17 years old he lived in argyle texas went to argyle high school uh, he played for me at Northwestern State, ended up matriculating down here and played for me uh, when I became the head coach here at the University of New Orleans. Um, and he and I were always very, very, very close. Uh, he went on to play professionally and uh, overseas in Australia and in England and Belgium and uh, Canada. But in the process of that, about a year into his professional career, uh, his family was tragically killed in an auto accident on vacation. So it was his two youngest siblings uh, who were under 10 uh, and then his mother and his stepfather. So uh, he ends up um, in reality really living with us uh, in his off seasons when he's back in the States. Um, his, all of his other family was in the Midwest, Iowa, Nebraska. Uh, so logistically it was easier for him to be down here with us to work out and then uh, so he stayed in stayed in our in our upstairs until uh, about a year ago when he bought his own when he bought his own house and he's on my staff now. But we talked a lot about how important it was for him being in my house that there were some questions uh, and him being a, a biracial uh, man who's six eight and I'm five eight five nine. Uh, but there was going to be some questions that not just Holden but Nola Ann and now Bo we're going to have that maybe, you know what, I just can't answer. Uh, and I don't, I can't profess to have the answer to everything. I haven't walked in those shoes uh, just like he hasn't walked in mine. And there's some things though that are going to come up, come about that, that I may not have an answer to. And I think in all the, in other cultures, uh, that's the uncle, uh, you know, and, and it was the Tio and, 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 Mexican culture, Latino culture, it's the Tio that uh, he's the he's Uncle Corey. And so there's some things in our, in our household that he knows that I'm counting on him uh, to be a role model and to answer some questions for my children that, you know, I may not be able to. And that could be 
uh, doesn't have to be family. It could be your best friend that you foster a relationship with, with at work. It could be someone that you went to school with. It could be someone that you're uh, in the same uh, synagogue with or, or you're, you go to church with or anything, but you have to reach out and get out of your comfort zone in the situation that you or I are in and make some relationships of which um, you can expose your children to some interactions with some people uh, that may look more like them than look like you. Right. And those who are part of the synagogue community um, know that my son Isaac gravitates to Christian, who is our, our receptionist, Hattie, who's a longtime member of the Emmanuel family. I mean, he talks about these, these people in our Jewish community and our Emmanuel family uh, quite regularly. And I think we're always thinking about other people that Elisa and I are connected to that could be great, great mentors or someone that can mirror that Isaac can see himself aspiring to be. Um, you know, you just brought up Corey, and obviously I have an affinity for Corey. I love seeing him when I get a chance to. But outside of your family, you have your student athletes, right, who look to you as a teacher, a coach. Um, you're, you're like family in, in many respects to these kids you've built relationships with, and they, they come to you from wherever they're from, whether they're from the Midwest, Texas, or you know, Bill Platt in Louisiana, um, but <laughs> had to drop a Bill Platt. Um, but, you, but, you know, what are some of the ways that you create an environment of partnership with your coaching staff and your student athletes that allows diversity and life experiences to be an asset, whether it's right. for other teammates or something you're trying to grow them as they become young men in our society? When, when we talk a lot about, about, being ambassadors and and we we really try to take the opportunity to be ambassadors not just for uh, people on the outside would automatically think oh well you're just talking about your program or you're talking about your university um, but for us we really try to big, build a bigger uh, brand or ambassadorship from the end of our city uh, not our family uh, our faith all those things and that the very first thing and I think everything that's happened in the social uh, seen in the social justice scene that's happened over the last few months is it's forced people in, in, to talk about having a dialogue. And one of the key tenets to what we do is that and immediately is we'll, we'll try to force our guys out of their comfort zone into having a dialogue with people, uh, opening up. So if we're at the airport, uh, we, gen we won't travel when we're walking, we won't wear our headphones. Now, if we're going to sit down at the gate, we're waiting on a flight or we're on the plane and we sit down in our seat, we'll put our headphones in. But normally we'll have our headphones off because I want our guys to be open and engaged to people uh, when they're in the TSA line and they're waiting to get on. And the lady uh, across the line from says, oh, you're, you're huge. How tall are you? Where are you from? What school do you go to? And it's opportunities for them to break down walls that somebody might have had. They may not have ever talked to somebody who either looks like them or is as tall as them or uh, is anything. They may, this is maybe their first opportunity uh, to change somebody, change their impression, change their outlook, and then also open up the, the door to communication to like we talked about uh, before of, uh, in this about how can we bring people into the circle that may not have been in the circle and expose them uh, to a better a more positive outlook on life. So whether that is with uh, just how we travel and how we engage with people in, in our travel or eating at a restaurant or staying at a hotel, but it also is our outreach in our community, whether it's our outreach with, with Special Olympics, uh, which is our best, uh, our most um, established uh, service partner that we've done stuff with for over 10 years, uh, or it's going and visiting different things while we're on our, our trip. We, we, last year we played at the University of Memphis and so we got to go to the Lorraine Hotel and the National Civil Rights Museum, uh, which in hindsight with everything that happened, uh, what a powerful experience uh, for our guys to be able to see and do uh, with everything that happened. Um, it, it was gave them uh, really a base to, to draw off of and I was so proud uh, that how they approached the trip and that they were open to learn and listen on that. And I think it really paid dividends for us uh, in how they've approached, how they want to make change, not only uh, with our team, but on campus. Wow. Yeah, that's really powerful. And then another question. Um, so a lot of what's going on in our society with 
you know, issues where there might be a racial bias really resonated and hit home for the University of New Orleans Athletic Department. This actually made national headlines after the Boston Globe ran it, but the athletic director at the University of New Orleans, Tim Duncan, who's a, a large black man who was a former college basketball player, not to be confused with Tim Duncan, the NBA legend. Uh, this Tim Duncan will tell you he's the original. Um, he was walking to his soon-to-be former residence because he was about to, you know, his family was about to move to New Orleans from Boston, and he was pulled over. Um, I think literally walking home with guns drawn by by the police. I mean, because he fit the description, so to say, of a reported suspect. And like I said, this drew national uh, attention. What has he or are you done to talk with the young? student athletes in your program or maybe the the whole athletic department about his own experiences because that that to me especially right after george floyd uh resonated and he wasn't originally going to tell a story if i'm not mistaken but he thought it was important to share his own experiences at the time correct yeah yeah no it was he wasn't going to tell a story and then he, he ended up and i'm so glad he did and i thought it was a, a powerful moment for him uh, but it was such a, a teachable uh, moment for our student athletes and for uh, the young people that he mentors. Um, it's very, uh, it's very powerful for our guys to have um, our, our athletic director and the guy to have a relationship with him uh, and him be able to, to really uh, carry on these, le these learning legacies uh, for him. And so it's been really neat for, for him to be able to do those things and teach those moments but it's, it's, it's very unique. Um, and I'm so happy that he was uh, brave enough to share that with us and for us to be able to learn from it and our guys to really take a lot from that. And he's handled it with a lot of grace and uh, it's been pretty cool to see. And then my last question for you in this time, and again, I appreciate you coming on and I like to end conversations with an action item or, or a takeaway. If, there was one thing that we talked about, or maybe it's something that comes to mind right now for you that you'd want someone watching this to take away. Um, what would that be? I, I, I would encourage people to, uh, to seek out a conversation, to seek out dialogue, uh, and then to take action uh, of how they can help. Um, it's one thing to, to say, okay, I want to listen to what you're saying. I want to listen to where you're coming from. And I think you're in a very unique uh, situation where your faith, where, where you can, people can understand you. you if anybody can understand in, in certain aspects, you can. Uh, and you want people to understand your faith better. And you want people uh, to hear why you love your faith. And you want people to understand why you have such a great community. Uh, and so hopefully people will take that dialogue and uh, branch out and get engaged in their community to listen, uh, but then to take action with the listening, to get out and, and volunteer, to get out to be a part of something bigger than just themselves. Uh, you know, it, I obviously will always, will always advocate for foster care. Get involved with foster care. Uh, take an action. Uh, know that there's a need out there for people to, to listen, whether it's you as a foster parent, whether it's you uh, just giving respite as a foster parent, meaning that you're just going to watch the kids for an afternoon or you're just going to watch them for a night uh, to give the foster parents a break or to allow them to go shopping or allow them to do uh, some personal business that they have. To be a CASA representative, which is a court appointed special advocate uh, where you serve as a liaison between the judge, uh, the child and the state uh, and you're the, the impartial third party. It's such a huge role. Uh, that people can can get involved in, and those are the things that I hope people will, will take away from it. That they'll that they'll take listen and then take a call to action, to go step out on faith and and be bold and and get involved in their community, and do something that maybe they hadn't thought of before. It's a lot of ways to get out and help uh, people, but but more importantly, in our conversation, uh, to help children. I mean, there's a lot of kids out there that that need some help uh, uh, of no fault of their own. And it's, it's, not, it's an imperfect system that's sometimes broken uh, that if people will care and love, uh, it is a lot easier and a lot better. And you know what I was thinking? I had Juan Kincaid on uh, maybe a month or two ago, and I asked him at the end, and I, I completely did not 
put this question in my list and I really screwed up by doing it. Whenever I have someone from New Orleans, I got to ask what their favorite restaurant is before, before we go. Oh, okay. I, I know what you're going to, I know what you're going to say, but it, it needed to be asked. And we do have a lot yeah. of uh, New Orleans people that watch this from, right. from within the congregation. So it's an important question to ask and I'd get run through the, the ringer if I didn't. So I got to ask, what are your favorite restaurants? If you could have like your perfect breakfast, lunch, and dinner, yeah. what would those restaurants those in New are, Orleans be? Those are good ones. Uh, at breakfast, I'm going to go to Russell's Marina Grill in Bucktown, right up here on the lake. Uh, uh, Mr. Pavlo, uh, I call him the, the Greek freak of the kitchen. Uh, he has the absolute best breakfast in the city. Big Al is this uh, bigger-than-life character uh, of a man who, who works in there and uh, is – part-time uh, entertainer, part-time uh, busboy, part-time uh, mixologist on morning mimosas and Bloody Marys. And that would be my breakfast lunch. Uh, I mean, I'm so torn. I love Sammy's on Elysian Fields. I love Parkway uh, Bakery. Uh, I'm, in, I'm into this place in Metter, this little deli called Quick Check. Right now, I've, I've been there too many times uh, to pick up on uh, since the pandemic, uh, which is just another little po' boy shop, a little deli. And dinner, I'm going to go to Katie's in Mid-City. It's the best. It's the quintessential neighborhood New Orleans restaurant. If you want to know what New Orleans is like, just people out having an evening meal um, and what New Orleans personalities and characters and people are like with a mix of great food, then... Obviously, it's Katie's and, and Chef Scott Craig and his family and what they do there. And what you did mention is there's a dish named after you at Katie's Oyster Schlesinger. So, yeah, I've, I, my waistline worked very hard to get that honors, by the way. So, <laughs> My favorite restaurants, just so you know, and I went on the record with this with, with Juan, was Surrey's for breakfast on Magazine, Katie's okay. for lunch, um, and then Mr. B's in the French Quarter for dinner. Those yeah. would be my three. And, of course... Mr. B's, I don't share the dessert with Elise. It's the only place I'm allowed to do that. Yeah, um, <laughs> there's, too, there's too many to count. That's the hard part. That's the problem. But uh, I want to thank you for coming on, Coach Slash. Appreciate you coming on. Thank David Tanner behind the glass, if you will. I apologize. My cat, Sammy, always makes appearances. It's just what happens. Um, but be on the lookout for, for future episodes. This conversation airs Wednesdays at 12 on the Emmanuel Facebook page. And for those on the website, the Proler Chapel streaming, it's also archived on our YouTube page. Upcoming um, conversations we have are with Judge Bob Schaefer and cellist Brenton Smith of the Houston Symphony. Again, I appreciate Coach Sless, you coming on, and we will see everyone next week. Have a good day. Thank you so much, Jason.